Hi everyone, you're listening to the Brown History Podcast. My name is Essen and this is episode 24. On today's episode, our guest is Jessica Namakal. She is the author of the book, Unsettling Utopia. Not only do we explore with her the rise and fall of French rule over India, but we also get to take a deeper look into these Western-led ashrams and so-called utopian communities, such as Oroville, that have remained in India after decolonization and are still thriving and growing. It's all really fascinating and insightful, and it makes you re-examine everything. So let's check it out. Let's begin. India, yeah, India will make it controversial. I'm sure people will have that under control. It depends uh, if you have any political opinions, then yeah, we have a... Yeah, that's right. Um, I saw your book on Twitter in my Twitter feed, and it was about French India. Right. Which I realized I, I barely see anything about French India. There's not much in the media or books. I think the most I saw on French India was the book Life of Pi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, why? How come no one ever talks about French India? Is it because they're is it because it's so small compared to British India? Or maybe they were, I guess, nice as colonizers go. But then you think of Algeria. Yeah. And you're like, that can't be true. So I guess we can talk about that after. So your book is about basically the making of India and it kind of goes into decolonization of French mm-hmm. India. Mm-hmm. And then it goes to these ashrams, which I want to see what the connection is. We can start off with French India. What was it like there? How different was it from British rule? Yeah. Uh, how long did they rule for? So the, the French um, come to India um, much in the way the British did as a trading company. So the French East India Company. Um, so they're there early, right? They're there in... Um, They're there in the 17th century, uh, you know, setting up trading posts, much like the Dutch and the Danish and the French and the English and everyone else. Um, So they're part of that. There was a moment in the 18th century and this sort of culminates in the Seven Years War, which is a global war really between uh, France and England, um, where France really, especially in South India, tries to take greater control. You know, this is also England until this point isn't really a, you know, a major colonizer. It's trading posts. They're starting to create these forts. Right. So the big one in um, Madras presidency at the time, actually France and England are sort of battling for and the British destroy the fort at Pondicherry during that. Um, and I don't know if you know who Tipu Sultan is, uh, really, uh, um, but he, you know, he, he actually sides with the French <laughs> against uh-huh. the British. So he's like writing letters to the monarchy, um, and he's trying to get the French uh, more power um, yeah. as, as a fight with the British. So there's this moment in there where, fr- you know, France could have taken more power there. But this is, you know, this is a, these are proxy wars um, between empires that are happening just globally. This is where, you know, land is changing in North America between the French and the British, especially in Canada. Um, but in, in the southern U.S. too, actually all over the U.S., or the eastern yeah. seaboard. Um, so, so there is a moment where the French uh, could have taken more, but it's um, so the French are the French Indian colonies, which at the time are really trading posts. Um, they're called comptoirs, which are um, trading posts. Um, or um, so, so they're really they're not being they're not any sort of under any sort of direct rule until a little bit later. Um, and it's not actually until like the French Revolution has happened. There's more England and France fighting all over the world. And in 1814 is when Napoleon finally loses um, everything. <laughs> the, the British finally say, OK, there's these five areas in India that are French now. Like we're going to stop battling over these. So they sort of they, they formally um, give them over in 1814 um, with the stipulation that they can't have a military. Oh. Yeah, so the Cottagecherry is the and you know made famous by Life of Pi again, especially in Canada, where <laughs> the author of that book is from. Um, but uh, uh, they they are the so the other ones are the other major one is Chandranagar, which is basically a suburb of Calcutta, right? And th- this actually is very important in terms of the anti-colonial um, movements because it is sovereign territory outside of British India where. Um, Bengali revolutionaries can sort of abscond to, right? So it becomes a huge headache for the British in the early 20th century. So Chandanagar all the way up in Bengal, Pondicherry down in Madras presidency at the time, today Tamil Nadu, just south of that is Karakal. And then Yanam is in contemporary Andhra and then uh, Mahe is in Kerala. So they're, they, you know, they're, they're, 
um, not next to each other. And, you know, in some cases very far away from each other. That's and they have weird. some maps in the book that, that show this. So that spatial distance is really important and why the British like weren't very worried about it. Right. Um, it's not like they were a military threat and they don't see them as any kind of threat until the um, anti-colonial started like hiding there. <laughs> right. Yeah. So they mostly think of them as a headache. Right. But, but this means that the French, for the French, it's a really important presence. Right. Um, there, is the, there is sort of this sense that they they lost in India. Right. Yeah. There, there is sort of like a regret there. Uh, we could have we could have been the major power here um, because they don't you know, they occupy Algeria in 1830. Um, so that happens, you know, these, these are part of the old colonies, um, what in France is called the old colonies. So that, you know, most of those are in the Caribbean. Yeah, so, you know, Saint-Domingue becomes Haiti in 1804, right? And that's the major, like most of this is. So, and they don't, they're not in Indochina, which is the closest to India. They're not there until the late 19th century, right? Um, and then it, Punisher becomes really important as a port. Mm -hmm. um, for Indochina then, and then much more important in the 20th century. So like in, in some ways it, it, it continues to remain because the British just don't care about them very much. You know, in the records, in the consulate um, letters that are reports that the British consulates are writing, they like all hate being assigned to Pondicherry. They like think it is a backwater that is just like hot, and <laughs> like uninteresting. Um, so they just have no interest in that, but it really looms really large in the French imagination. And if you talk to people um, from France, especially people over, you know, who grew up um, before the end of the empire, it's, they lose Algeria in 1962. Yeah. So if you went to public school or, you know, were educated in France before that, you grew up reciting the names, Karikal, Mahe, Yanam, Chanadigar, oh, Pondicherry, in like a list of the parts that were of the world that were France. So that, you know, people still know these places in France and there is more um, history written about it in, in French. There's a lot more literature in French about, about these, these areas. Um, so it's not that it doesn't exist, but it hasn't, I mean, I, I'm, I've been talking for a really long time so I can stop, but no, um, no, okay. I think there's, um, some important reasons, you know, in the book, I argue that there are some important reasons why there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to French India um, in terms of sort of the Anglo literature on it. And, you know, mm -hmm. part of this is just the way that post-colonial histories have been written, you know, even, you know, within, and you've done so many amazing interviews with other um, historians and scholars. Um, so you, you have a sense of this, I'm sure. But, you know, even in the field of contemporary South Asian studies, you know, it's really uh, dominated by Bengal in a lot of ways, if not sort of Hindi speaking um, uh, parts of India. So like already the South isn't really looked at in the same way. There are certainly historians of um, Tamil India, but you know, it's not, it, it, you know, if you look at the makeup of uh, history departments and of the field, it's not it is in no way <laughs> the majority of what's happening there. So that's some of it. Um, but you know, what happens really is that England and France and, and really get sort of assigned to their colonial world. Right? And I think you know, this is um, something that I really liked uh, what you do with uh, the Instagram and with your podcast is really um, like question, question the national borders and how we think of history within those boundaries, right? Because I think that's exactly what is happening here, which is like, if you're going to read about colonial India, then you read about, then you're, you're doing English history, you're doing British history, right? If you're going to read about um, North Africa, that's going to be French. So they get really assigned sort of areas of the world. And there's just like not a lot of penetration of that, of those borders in there. So, you know, it's, um, if you train in uh, South Asian history, you're also doing training in British history. And a lot of South Asian historians are actually British historians and, you know, no matter yeah. what their sort of personal background is, you know, you might have a South Asian person, but, you know, they did British history and um, things like this. So part of it is just legibility in the field, I think. Wow. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I say this in the intro to the book too, it's actually just a matter of resources. So it's actually really hard in terms of, um, Find, uh, uh, just getting the money and being able to have the time to, to like travel to these different places because the records um, of colonial French India were repatriated to France 
and they're currently they're at the Colonial Archives, which are in uh, Aix en Provence again, a nice place to go. It is a very nice place to go. But if you are, you know, if, if you're French Indian, if you live in Pondicherry, you know, you and you say you don't have a French passport, first of all, you need to like get a visa and all of this, but you're not near the records of your your history, right? And this is true for all of the colonies, right? All of the colonial records go to the British Library. And they go to, and you know, the, for for British India, a lot of that has now been copied and digitized, and you know, might be in Delhi. But um, so for the major major leaders and things like that, so for some of those, you can actually get those in India, but certainly not for the smaller areas. So you know, for me, that meant you know, working in London, working in Paris at the diplomatic archives, which are in a suburb in Nanterre. That right, yeah, um, in Paris, mm -hmm. and then in X, and then in the um, state archive that um, or the Pondicherry State Archive in Pondicherry, and then the Orville archives and things like this. So you just you know it takes an, like an immense amount of time. And money. Because, you know when you're doing history, you could find a record in France and then be like, oh, like this other one's in London or it's in India, right? So you you just have to be really methodical about it. And then, of course, like the Indian archives are just not as sort of functional. Um, maybe I shouldn't say, of course, but, you know, for financial reasons um, as as the ones, you know, you, you don't get the records online in the same way, especially again in state archives, like the national ones a little different. So it's uh, so some of it is just there's not if you're doing a project and, you know, history gets written in these disciplines right? people need to finish their PhDs, people need to get jobs you know, uh, is it legible to the field? Will anyone, I, I was convinced for a long time, just nobody was going to care about French India. Okay. And my, um, here at Duke, we have, we are lucky to have a preeminent uh, historian of, of Tamil Nadu, Samathi Ramaswamy. And she told me, like, stop apologizing for Pondicherry. People study these tiny towns in America and write like <laughs> huge books about them and never, you know, expect everybody to know where this like, a uh, town of 2,000 people in Mississippi is, you know, Pondicherry is a major place. You should <laughs> stop, uh, stop thinking people won't care about it. But it, but there was, you know, it's it's it is marginal in in the field because of that. And I tried to show why it shouldn't be. What well, what was it like living under French India rule? Yeah, and um, so I, I the really important thing to know, especially about Pondicherry, is it is really fractured. Um, and I know this is a podcast, um, but if you can find a picture, and there's pictures in the book of a map of what Pondicherry looked like, it was split up on a micro level. So the the cover of the book is actually a, a police officer, a, an, a, a French. Now I actually I think he's an Indian police officer. Uh, standing in a village and there's uh, rocks down the middle, but he's standing literally on the border between, this is post 47. So it's on the Indian slash French Indian border. And so they were divided by by rocks, by by walls? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Um, so like, and, and the point, of, you know, if you look at this, um, it's, you know, there's, uh, there's houses on one side, you know, thatched houses and people just sort of standing. What they're doing, this picture is actually, it's a murder investigation. So wow. they're trying to decide like which side this guy was murdered on. Right. So there's the other pictures have like like brain matter in it. And it's like some of it's in French India and some of it's in India. <laughs> it's like a jurisdiction issue. Um, so you can see the bureaucratic headache this caused a lot of people. But it's 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 just it's fractured on this minor, minor level. Right. Which, you know, we, we see this a lot in colonial territorialization, but there are lots and lots of borders in a small area. So they're, um, the French call these communes and they, communes not in the collective sense, but um, in the, and that's what the territory was called. Um, so again, if you can look at a map at it, um, you'll see areas that are just um, enclaves in, in British India, right? Um, and so sometimes, you know, early on in the 19th century, these weren't really policed very much, but they are in the 20th century. And they um, they are under the British, and then they are under India. <laughs> Wait, right? so, so there, so let me picture this. There's a town called Pondicherry, and in this town, there are parts that belong to the French, and there are parts that belong to India. Yeah, after forty seven, and they're all scattered around. Like the, right. there's no like distinct line in between the. Two no, states. and let me tell you, those borders still exist. They still exist. And, yeah, so if you go there, you will see them as traffic uh, like stanchions now. Um, you know the like concrete barriers. Yeah, it will say like now leaving Union Territory of uh, Puducherry, um, as they changed their name to. But the, it's like abandoned. They they don't mean anything anymore, right? 
Well, they do because of taxes. So Pondicherry and all, Chandranagar voted to join the Indian Union in 1949. They had a referendum and that referendum never happened for the rest of the territories. So in 49, Chandranagar joins India. They're Indian okay. now. Um, but so Karikal, Yanam, uh, Mahe, and Pondicherry are still one administrative union, unit and they're the Union Territory of Pondicherry. So they're, they're governed together still today. And even though they're, they're separated, vastly separated from each yeah. other, they're all one because, yeah. of, because of French That's right. colonization. And this was, like, this was part of the negotiation because people didn't want to be like swallowed up by this, by these other territories. Of course, not everybody. There's not everybody agreed on all of this, but they wanted to be administrated um, separately. Wow. So, you know, Pondicherry is not part of Tamil Nadu. No. So they actually, one of the reasons people like the vacation there is the alcohol is a lot cheaper. Alcohol is a lot cheaper. I guess they have French architecture there. Here you go. You got it. Has right that look, there. has that, has that look to it. Yeah, it has that look. Looks like New Orleans a little bit. Yeah. Uh, did they speak that? Did they still speak French there? People speak French. There, there is, um, there's the Lycée Française there. So there's a French language school. Um, and there are other French, uh, the ashram school um, is English. They also do French there. Um, but you know, I, the majority of, um, well, I don't know. I don't have a number on this. There are people there. I think the number is something like 10 or 12,000 people in Pondicherry today have French citizenship. Um, maybe that's bigger actually. There's a movie, a recent documentary called Two Flags by a documentarian named uh, Pankaj Kumar, um, where he like, talks to the people who are French Indian hold passports and um, that's worth checking out. Um, so a lot of those people speak French and part of that is because um, you don't have to, like these are, um, these are uh, citizenships that are passed down within families. So you could not speak French and be French today in mm -hmm. Um But people that want to go to France will go to the Frank la French language schools, right? And they have to, to go to school in France, um, you basically have to take the same tests that French students do in France. Mm -hmm. uh, at the at the Lycée Française, at the Alliance Française, um, you would you would be taking the BAC, which is the the French exam, um, to go to France. So you know, there's a lot of you know families wanting their kids to go to school in France, um, where they would go for free, right? Or to for the tuition would be free, um, and things like this. So th those people will speak French, um, certainly over a certain age. Although these people are really there aren't many left, um, but people that served in the wars right, um, that are veterans. A lot of them stayed in France, but they have French pensions. So your French pension goes a lot more, uh, like further in Pondicherry than it does yeah. in, in France, right? So people moved back, but again, um, the, that generation is really dying off. Um, so there aren't many people left, but be, um, beyond that, you know, it's for, it's for tourism. Like every French person who goes to India goes to Pondicherry. Yeah. There's a direct flight from Paris to uh, Chennai. Right. No, no, no one else does direct flights to Jen out of out of Europe. That's right. Um, and it's it's like directly and some Pondicherry's airport is um marginal. Sometimes they're operating, sometimes they're not. Sometimes there's a flight, uh, and sometimes <laughs> there's I usually take a take a car from from Chennai, but um so there's like a huge French tourist in industry. So you know, if you're if you wanna own a restaurant or you know, anything like this, you're going to learn French. But you know, everyone speaks French, Tamil, and English, right? I mean, it's that's what tourism is like. Yeah. There. Um, so I I, I was talking to a, a journalist from Calcutta recently, um, and told her like I doubt that there has, you know, I, I mean I hate to say ever, but I, I bet the number of French Indians to million Indians who only spoke French is basically zero. Right. But this is true of just about anyone in India who in India speaks one language. True. Right. Um, so maybe you speak French and Tamil and you don't speak English. Although like today that would be very hard. Yeah. In fact, unless you grew up in France. You can maybe yeah. speak French, you know, basic tourism French, just enough to get what you, you know, sell what you need to sell to the tourists, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But so, there is I mean, there's a lot of French investment in Pondicherry. So. Really? Yeah, yeah, in terms of sort of building restaurants and, and restaurants, yeah, and resorts. And I mean, it's on the beach, right? I mean, Pondicherry is like, it's, it's well located. It's a nice place. It's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful, yeah. warm place. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's what, the, when the French left, um, 
that's what they did. They granted uh, citizenship to all their... They gave you the option and it was called the period of option. So something about this 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 time, again, China Nagar voted overwhelmingly in 1949. I mean, the no vote was very small. I'd have to look up the numbers, but so they, they joined the union. Um, it never happens. And then in 1954, and this is, this is interesting because this really follows the timeline of um, sort of the, the France starting to lose its empire. So 1954, France loses Indochina. Yeah. Um, right. So they lose it, um, Yen Bien Phu. And at sort of after that, they agree to leave French India. And, you know, this has been a diplomatic conversation on one level. So, you know, the Nehru government has been working very closely with France. They, you know, they're not interested in keeping France in India, but they also don't want to make a big deal out of it. <laughs> Right. right. Um, but there's, and this is what I do in the book, is I just sort of look at what's going on on the ground. This is um, post 1947. Post 1947. Okay. Um, and so in it's it's in 1954, there's just a, a sort of all signs point to they're going to become part of India, and France agrees to leave, but they don't ratify that treaty until they lose Algeria. And it's actually in the Avian Accords where they officially cede Algeria, where they finally pass the legislation in 1962. So while they have like been leaving since 1954, it takes almost a decade, right? So they're kind of hanging on until they really lose the empire. Um, so after Algeria is gone, they, they agree. And then there's a six month period called the option where if you would like to be French, you have to bring a certain set of documents and you bring them to the council and you declare and you like do a public declaration. Um, otherwise you automatically become an Indian citizen. So I think it's, it's something like four or five percent of the population um, opts for French citizenship. Really? I thought it would be a lot more. Yeah. So if you talk to people, um, like people didn't know. Oh, no one just told them? That's it? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, you know, Pondicherry, again, Pondicherry is, you know, it's an Indian city. It has over a million people today. It's like pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but for India, that's not that big, actually. But, you know, so if you look at those little communes again that are at those enclaves, people are, you know, rural villagers nobody's like they, i'm sure they don't speak french nobody's out there like telling them there's like the french aren't out like become a french citizen right they have no interest in a bunch of people claiming french citizenship um so it's really the people france had allowed uh people in french india to become citizens starting in the 1880s um so there were there were families that had been citizens for generations Right. So um, they like made sure to go and claim that some other people for various reasons, including, you know, people who had um, fought the military. Um, other people had an interest in sort of migrating to France. People chose um, to become French citizens, but the vast majority of people like they didn't opt in. They um, by default were given Indian citizenship. By default. So, so you can't like, I, you know, unless you went out and did, which somebody should do extensive oral history with people, it would be hard to know how many people wanted it. Um, again, this, this film, Two, Two Flags, he actually talks to people now who were like, they did it, their families didn't get it, but they're trying to get it now. Um, so there is a sense certainly that people didn't know um, or like the documents were too hard. And this is another thing. Um, if you talk to anyone about citizenship today in India, right? It's very hard to get the documents people yeah. want, you know, Europeans yeah. want or the Indian state wants for you to be a citizen because who has that stuff, right? I mean, nobody was sort of keeping these records. That's just a, a regime that um, that wasn't in place. So um, so there's still some some discussion about that, but, but what yeah. About, what about the people who are French, but were born there and then only know, only knew for, cause like in Algeria yeah. you had, I think they're called the Pied Noir. Yeah. Right. And these people were kind of they didn't fit in Algeria anymore and they didn't fit in France anymore. And they were kind of confused. So did you kind of have a, a group of people like that in Pondicherry? It was really confused is a really gentle word for the P.A. Noir. By the way. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, you know, French India was not a settler colony like well, Algeria was. So the P.A. Noir are settlers. Right. Settlers. That's what they are. Right. I um, mean, they are the reason that the Algerian war was fought. It wasn't, it really, the majority of that was not for the French state. That was for the PNR, who, you know, France didn't want back. And then they all moved back. A million plus people just sure. went to France. Um, and so that, you know, in France, uh, Algeria is really close to France. I mean, it's next door to France, right? So you don't sort of have those concerns with French India. Again, you know, French India is, 
before 47, it's symbolic in a lot of ways. It is, it is, you know, there are material consequences, especially because of Indochina, um, because it's a port, um, you know, to the, to all of these spaces, but it's really in a lot of ways, sort of a diplomatic symbol, right? I mean, after 47, like India is this emerging superpower, right? I mean, you want it and, and they're emerging superpower that have a bone to pick with England. So for France, you know, it's like, of course we want to be friends with India, right? Like yeah. we have this opportunity where, you know, the British were the bad guys here. So we have an opportunity to like have the good relationship with this um, like emerging huge economic power. Um, you know, even if it's not an economic power, it's a huge market. Yeah. Right. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons um, that France wants to be friends with, with India. And, you know, it should also be mentioned in this that at the same time, the Portuguese are still in India too. Right. The Portuguese are under a dictatorship, right? So this is not friendly. Nobody is like having a friendly conversation with Portugal in this time period. So they actually, they have to liberate Goa through military means, which was just like not, not the case in French India because they were trying to negotiate, right? This, 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 this harmed people on the ground a lot, um, you know, who got caught in sort of these, um, crossfires of two states who didn't actually care what the people there thought very much right but you don't there's no settler population um so you have mostly again there are some french families and by french here i'll mean white french families who have been around for a few generations but it's pretty small right um and most of them go back to france um a few linger but it's like a few you know um sort of random families and then what you really have instead of like a Pied Noir situation is you have a lot of French Indians who are ethnically Tamil or Malayalam or um, Bengali or whatever it may be, who have been French citizens legally for many generations and who like don't really want to be Indian citizens, right? So some of them are arguing for dual citizenship. Right, um, but pe French Indians are really, you know, a, a big difference between British, you asked this earlier, but a big difference between British India and French India is British India never gives anyone citizenship. No. And people in Britain didn't have citizenship either. And I know you just talked to uh, Ian Sanjay Patel, who obviously um, goes into all of these British, which are, I, I love his book. I'm so glad it came out because there are, the British citizenship subject question is like incredibly complicated. Yeah. Um, on the part, you know, on purpose, I think, on the part of the British. <laughs> but, um, but this was, you know, uh, very much on, on purpose. So the French had been, you know, this is part of their civilizing mission, which is really at the core of their empire. Um, England, you know, while they were invested in education and, you know, you know, Macaulay and India and all of these people talking about educating the native and whatnot, they never had an approach that was sort of about universal rights in the way that the French did after the revolution. You know, and we can talk about all the ways that it's hypocritical and racist. And, you know, I, I, it's not hard to find work on this now, especially regards Algeria or, or Haiti or um, French West Africa. Um, we know the, you know, the universal uh, liberalism of the French Revolution is not for everybody. Um, but this was really at the core of their empire. And India was a good place for them to show it because it didn't have a lot of consequences. Right. There just wasn't they didn't govern that many people in India. Yeah. So it's like they the could give PR you PR marketing campaign. Yeah. And it didn't, it, you know, it was fine. You know, like a couple Indians are going to come to France. Fine. People like are really into sort of the spiritual ideas and they think Hindus are magical or whatever. So it's like, it's fine with them <laughs> to, to do that. Um, so they really did get to use it as a way of saying, we've been giving people citizenship. We are invested in the, in the sovereignty of citizens and England has never been in England. It has never been. I mean, that was true. That was true. But did it work for the, the campaign, the marketing campaign? Did it work for Yeah. It? Oh, yeah. Good? So there's a lot of French Indians around decolonization, like they they are pretty happy being French. Oh, wow. Right. They might want, you know, and this is actually where the Union Territory of Pondicherry comes from, is like they are, you know, they see the government in Delhi. You know, they saw how, you know, Gandhi, who was, of course, assassinated right after um, liberation or independence. But, you know, he was the one like right at um, the moment of independence, like issued this statement in, in Tamil that said like basically hang tight, we're gonna take care of it. Don't do anything drastic, French Indians, right? Um, we're working on it. We're gonna get, we're gonna get you out of there. 
you know, but people didn't necessarily want that. Some did, right? And there actually is really intense sort of campaigning and the policing gets really intense, which I go into in the book around, um, around these issues of independence on either side. Um, but they, uh, but yeah, you know, plenty of people were like, we are French citizens, we can go to France. Like, of course they didn't have the money or the means to go to France, but France was like, you can come here, right? You're French. And it's not until people get there and it's mostly people who are in the military. And they were like, oh, people don't think I'm French. I don't look like the French people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's just like incredibly immediately obvious, but France really, and this is part of the utopianness of the title of the book is, France really paints itself as this liberal utopia. Yeah. And you know it's not unless you go there. Definitely not. Right? So, yeah. So, yes, I think it works. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about ashrams. Uh-huh. Right. Let's do that. Okay. So, I, from my experience, like from what I've read in books, you always see, they're more like cults. And and usually these cults are in the States or in North America or Europe. My next book is that. Yeah. So, this is, this in this case, you have a cult, you have an ashram yeah. by Europeans or by European women in India. So it kind of, it's kind of the opposite. I want to know what was the significance of talking about ashrams when you're talking about decolonization? Yeah, so like, so two things. One is the, there's an ashram, which is the Aurobindo ashram. I mean, that's in Pondicherry, but Oroville is not an ashram. Oh, it's not? Yeah, Oroville is a intentional community and they've never claimed to be an ashram. What's the difference? And, so the big, the, I mean, the ashram is um, everybody who is a member of the ashram is dedicated to the um, dedicated to the study of Sri Aurobindo and Mira Alfasa, or the mother. Like they are there to live like an ascetic life, you know, towards the mission of the ashram, which is to study these thinkers and live the life that they were. And you know, ashrams are incredibly common in India, right? I mean, there's huge ones you hear about, like the Sai Baba ashrams. Um, all these, you know, Gandhi has an ashram. Um, people, you know, it's especially in this this early 20th century period, ashrams are a big deal. Um, so, you know, like uh, the the Maharishi Yogi where the Beatles go, right? In, yeah. In Rishikesh, right? All of these are ashrams. Yeah. So ashrams are really um, prevalent. And, you know, it's, um, I, I'm not even going to say it's, it's you know, like related to Hindu thought because like, what is that? Um, but, it, but it is, you know, associated in India at least with sort of people that have some relationship to a Hindu tradition, you know, so you don't have um, Islamic leaders starting ashram. So it's mostly, I mean, like Aurobindo has his own form of um, yoga. It's called integral yoga. That is what he creates as a system of thought and the mother is like a part of that. Um, the mother being Mira Foster. Uh, so, um, you know, it's not like he uh, is, he's not a, like a Brahmin priest or anything like this, but he uh -huh. has, his own. He's, a, he's a guru, he's a guru. He's a guru. Right, um, just like the, the, uh, the Maharishi and all these other people. So it's not, in that way, it's incredibly common actually. Um, and I don't, I don't know what the number of ashrams in India is, but I'm sure it's huge, right? Um, so what makes it so, so Oroville, Oroville, so uh, or, well, let's Oroville. go back to the origins of Oroville, I guess, yeah. because there are a lot of people who don't know what Oroville is. So Oroville has been uh, in the news a lot recently because of this new book by Akash Kapoor, which is, he's from Oroville. He grew up in Oroville. Um, I don't know him personally. I know his, his writings on this, um, but he, he grew up there. And so it's a, you know, memoir insiders sort of perspective thing. Um, so, you know, one of the things, things that I think is really important to understand is the uh, where the ashram came from um who's there what are they doing there um you know and all of those kinds of questions to give a context and I, I actually I'll, I'll loop back to where you started with how come we don't hear about French India because I doubt when you hear about Oroville in the media right now you hear much about French India right no, it's um, at all you don't, right? Never, um, it, not even. Yeah. If anything, it just looks like a giant summer camp for, it's like Burning Man, but all year long. Yeah, it's like, a, I haven't been to Burning Man, but I think it, it's either. more It's more comfy than it's Burning It's comfy. Man. It's like a chill hangout place for, it doesn't seem anything uh, religious or anything. No, it doesn't need to. So again, the ashram is, is the, like, is the serious space of study. Yeah. Um, and the ashram and Oroville have actually been um, bureaucratically split since the early 1980s and the uh, India Supreme Court had to get involved in this because there was so much friction between the groups. 
But to get back to the origins of Oroville, and I'll get there. Yeah. Um, Oroville is founded in 1968, a very global year um, for, for projects like this to start. But Orbindo had passed away in 1950, right? So he'd been gone 18 years. That's a long time um, before Oroville is even founded. Um, and it, this is, you know, six years after the French had left. I, Oroville, I should say, is in Tamil Nadu. It's not on French land um, or former French land. It's not in the U in territory of Pondicherry, although it's you know much like um, Pondicherry, it's it's split up, right? And this is a uh, part of what my um, one of my arguments in this book is about is like that that is about land acquisition, right? Like they want more, they would love to acquire more land. Um, so so, but they're only there, and this is why I I make this argument that you really have to understand the history of French India to understand what Oroville is doing there, because there's no way it would be there if the French hadn't been in India. Right, so you know, to give a little bit of what I mean about that, um, Orville was sort of the project of Orbindo and the mother. They had conceived of it. Or this is what their story is that they had conceived of it. Um, you know, since they sort of started working together in the ashram, and the ashram is is, is founded in 1926. Okay, Orbindo had come to Pondicherry in 1910 as a basically as a refugee from um, from British India. Right, the British were trying to. Um, he had already been arrested in sedition charges, but he was wanted in a bombing um, that had happened. Um, so he leaves through Chandanagar, takes a boat down to Pondicherry, arrives in 1910 and never leaves Pondicherry again. And so Aurobindo, this is actually really important though because Aurobindo is still remembered as a really important anti-colonial um, freedom fighter. Even though after, after he goes to Pondicherry, he's not involved in the freedom struggle anymore. You know, okay. he uh, withdraws, he becomes a thinker, he comes up with integral yoga and he says, you know, I don't do politics anymore. Of course, I believe in the freedom of India and I'm like anti-colonial, but I'm, I'm dedicating my life to, to the thought of yoga, right? right. Um, so that starts in 1910. Um, and the mother first comes in 1914 with her then husband, a man named Paul Richard, and he was a French colonial officer. He was a silver servant. So he was sent to Pondicherry. Um, the mother, you know, I think it's interesting to note that Mira Alfasa had been involved in a lot of um, sort of esoteric, not quite theosophy, but theosophy adjacent movements in France. So she was really into the occult. She was really into um, Eastern spirituality in our most um, Edward Saidian sense of <laughs> intellectual <laughs> right? Um, so when, you know, when uh, her husband gets uh, stationed in Pondicherry, she's super excited, right? Because she actually really wants to meet Orbindo. She's really interested in what he's doing. And so is, so is Paul. So is Paul Richard. Um, and he wrote a memoir um, called Without a Passport. That's what it's called. Um, so they go there. They're actually, they're only there for a little bit. They, they start sort of a friendship with Orbindo. Um, they start writing together about spiritual matters. Um, they are sent to um, back to France and then to Japan because of the war. Um, so mm -hmm. this is during the First World War. And then after the war passes and all of this, the mother like makes her way back to Pondicherry with Paul. And then Paul kind of disappears from the picture. Um, she's like, I'm going to stay. I'm staying here, <laughs> right, with Orobindo. And then Paul just kind of. We don't goes. know what happened to him. Okay. Yeah, he writes about it in the memory. He just, he just leaves, basically. It's not, okay. it's not a great mystery. Um, <laughs> but, but so he's out of the picture. I'll put it that way. So right. from that point, the early 1920s um, until Orobindo's death, it's really the mother and Orobindo. And he gives her the name, the mother in 1926 when they sort of officially um, found the ashram. And the ashram, you know, um, there are different people in it, but it is largely Bengalis who are really interested in Orobindo and then people coming from France who know about the mother, right? Okay. So like, this makes sense, right? It's, you know, uh, people who sort of are following in the language of the people. Um, running it. Running it, but right, it's it's also important to know not only is this ashram in French India, right? So you you can see the relation, why, why Orobindo is there and why the mother's there. But it's it's in Tamil Nadu, right? Or it's in you know it's not in Tamil Nadu. It's it, it's on Tamil land, right? That's the people who live there. So you know it's it, we can think about India today as a you know one nation state, but of course there's all of these vast differences. And when we're talking about the difference between you know Dravidian language and um, and the Sanskrit language, is like there, there be a massive differences in Tamil. Um, Culture has a deep, rich history. It has a deep, rich, um, 
history, not just of literature, but of politics. And there are all kinds of independence movements happening in Tamil Nadu, right? And people, Tamil revolutionaries are also hiding out in Pondicherry, but they're not getting the kind of attention that Aurobindo is getting. I mean, maybe that's good. They're trying to be on the demo. Yeah. <laughs> right. But like all eyes are sort of on him, on Aurobindo. Um, and so mostly what you have is this uh, house in, um, you know, I haven't actually talked about this, but another important thing about Pondicherry is it's, it's racially segregated. Um, so there is, and today they've actually just kind of changed the name on Google Maps and things, but it's called the White Town. It's called the Vie Blanche. Um, and then Whoa. the rest of Pondicherry is Black Town. <laughs> And, so um, this is where one side would, where the French would live and the other town is where the locals would live. That's right. Um, and the, so it's on this, you know, if you've been to Pondicherry, you've been to the White Town. It, that's all of that seafront territory. It's that's like, a tourist area, I'm assuming. That's a tourist area. And the ashram owns a lot of that territory. Uh, buildings, not territory, but... The, buildings the, the in the buildings. White Town. That's right. Um, so starting really early, they started to sort of acquire buildings. And of course, the, like this money is coming from both Europe and from other parts of India, it's not just Bengal, but people who are, you know, interested in what Aurobindo is doing. So it's being financed. So if we just think about this, and this gets to this question of why decolonization, you know, I, my sense of decolonization, or what I'm trying to get to, and what I do is not just the bureaucratic process of European powers living, uh, leaving um, colonies, which is certainly one way that word is used and yeah. was perhaps used originally, but also in the sort of the contemporary struggle amongst indigenous peoples, um, which is very familiar to us in uh, North America, of course, Turtle Island, um, but of needing to center the question of land and property in, in thinking about what decolonization means, right? So again, we have this, um, I talk in the book quite a bit about the, sort of the idea of the minor, right? We have French India, we have South India, right? We have um, this really fractured territory. All of these things seem small and minor, right? But what's going on there is sort of these major powers, right? People with wealth, um, people with much more uh, notoriety, like people involved in French politics and in the Bengali revolutionary movement, are the ones buying up all this property in Pondicherry and like, yeah. sort of the nicest part of Pondicherry, right? And, you know, I, I, in the book, I talk about like local people just did not like the ashram, right? Like they didn't like how they were buying the, um, all the property. They didn't like the close ties they had with the French government, right? And even though they claimed they didn't and Alfasa always said the ashram is not political, her brother was the French colonial governor of Congo. Right, like she and her, you know, and her, her husband was a French too, colonial right? officer, yeah. I mean, she was part of it too, right? So it's, she calls herself an anti-colonial and other people have too, but I'm just like, she's an anti-colonial who's practicing colonialism. She's well, using colonial connections. Yeah, right? So it's not like- It's hypocritical. It's, it's hypocritical, but it's also, um, it's, it's, it's a little deeper than that, I think, because it's, um, you know, I think both the spiritualists get excused for a lot of bad behavior. <laughs> Okay, that's one of my uh, my arguments here. Right. You know, where you're sort of able to say, and again, you, this just comes from a, a wholesale adoption of Orientalist worldviews, right? Um, well, the mother, you know, is clearly very enlightened, right? Yeah. She knows, she has the spirit, she, she says she has this spiritual connection to India, and she says it's about the land over and over again, like, and, you know, we have this happening today <laughs> that I wasn't going to get political, but like Modi's doing the same thing with these like yoga days and the world sees how spiritually advanced Hindu India is. You know, this is an old argument. He certainly didn't create this argument. Right. And that's what she's doing. She's like, I'm I am French. Um, my soul is French, but I'm also Indian and I'm Indian because I have this spiritual connection to the land here. Well, what is the land? It's land that Tamil people have lived on for thousands of years that has been colonized by both the French and the British, right? So do you claim some sort of ability to um, like better care for the property because you have a spiritual enlightenment? And that's what's happening in Oroville, wow. like very explicitly because Oroville you know, unlike the ashram, when Orville's built, it's really meant to appeal, of course, to these enlightenment seekers, global enlightenment seekers. And in some ways, it's just a little bit boring because it's just sort of this liberal multicultural idea, right? You know, yeah. it's like, uh, I don't know if you've seen pictures of the Matra Mandir, but that's that center. There's a giant globe that's gold. 
And if you know anything about Disney World, it looks just like <laughs> Center. It looks just like it, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's it's actually it's interesting because that whole place is meant to be this sort of U- UN, um, you know, and whatever the UN's a separate issue, but a better world. That, yeah, but based on nations, and that's exactly what Orville is. They build all, build all these national pavilions. So there's a French pavilion. Um, like uh, the the India Pavilion is like dedicated to Sri Aurobindo, um, and again, like very um, Hindu focused there. Wait, Oroville is separated by nations? No, no, it's not. But they have like uh, they have like all clubs. Of their, yeah, yeah, I mean, you don't have to belong to one. That's not how your membership is determined. But that's like how they're celebrating culture, right? Is through again, sort of a national designation. Um, so like, the, so it's a, what it shows is this deep belief that there is like um, an objective material thing called national character and national culture, right? It's, it's a reinscription of this idea that, you know, um, there's one sort of French cultural tradition, there's one um, Indian cultural tradition. And this is like, you know, so they dedicate these um, pavilions. It's not like every nation of the world is uh-huh. represented or anything, um, but I think there's an Italian one. I'd have to look this up, but um but you know that people can st- like study those cultures there, right? Um, so I think that gets reflected in that. But the uh, you know back to the to the idea of the spiritualness of the land when they found when they found Oroville, um, it, it's again based on this national thing. Their op- their ceremony, which happens, I'm pretty sure I should look this up. February twenty eighth, nineteen sixty eight, or February second. It's in February nineteen sixty eight. Um, and they, they haven't really built anything yet. And they bus in all of these kids um, with soil from different parts of the world. And they have this ceremony. And sometimes it's, you know, Indian kids wearing a sash that says um, another country. But sometimes you have the German kids and the Italian kids. And they're it, like, it looks like a pageant, right? <laughs> they're wearing a sash that says Italy. Yeah. And then they carry like an urn of dirt from Italy. And they place it into this giant, um, this giant container. And this is supposed to be sort of the center piece of Orville of all the nations of the world coming together, right? And there's this telling moment um, in the, in the ceremony where they've like created a fence to keep all the Tamil people behind. It's that obvious. It is that obvious. Wow, right? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that kind of amazing. Yeah, you know. So it, it's 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 really interesting to me that they're really they're basing this project on ideas of land without acknowledging that there are people living on the land already. A, B, that they have purchased this land from people who are like pretty desperate for money because they are in the po- like immediate post-colonial war- years of as, as like a rural area of a much larger state right again because they're Tamil Nadu not not the Union Territory um so you have to think about sort of what's going on with development and agriculture in India in the 1960s to get a sense of that so they're pretty impoverished so people come in and like throw some money at them so they take it and then they become you know, underpaid, exploited laborers on that land for these people. Like you tell me what settler colonialism is, but that's what it is to me, right? They go, they go and they find this land that they claim nobody, you know, not, not only does nobody really live there, like they're always talking about it like it's an empty vessel, right? They talk about how it was um, deforested and it was empty and barren and yeah. the people that were there couldn't take care of it. Right. That is that is the idea of the tragedy of the commons. I think <laughs> I saw on Wikipedia I, that it said it was barren. It's they use that word over and over again. Right. And, you know, most of the people that are coming are coming from um, but they're coming. You know, they're coming from Australia. They're coming from Italy and Germany and France. They're coming from North America. And a lot of these people are if they're not coming from a settler colony, they're coming from a place that. Um, sort of has a strong narrative tradition of celebrating settler colonialism. So it is not surprising that people use that language all the time, right? They call themselves pioneers, right? Um, you know, they just act like they are, you know, we're gonna build this for the good of the other people. And once we, we sort of work out our business, then we'll open health clinics and schools for people that live here, right? Um, and that's really the model it's operated on. And, you know, if, it, you know, another way this could have gone, <laughs> is if all these people had come and they had said, we're going to work 
with the people that live here, right? We're not going to purchase their land from them. We're, we're instead going to find a way to do this mutually and ask, you know, their permission and, you know, actually listen to people. Instead, people are like, yeah, we should have learned Tamil, but it was really hard. So you learn a few words here and there. And like, people weren't that nice to us. And, you know, they're really backwards. And like, even the mother would say, well, these people can't really be Oravillians because they don't know, um, like they're not close enough to the divine. Right? Wait, is- so they, they're not allowed membership, the locals? Certainly not in the beginning. There are more now. There are more Tamil people and people from villages who are members now. It is certainly not um, the case that people are not included. But um, you have to think about sort of how this happens because most of the people that end up, that you don't join as a family, you join as an individual, you have to be on sort of this wait list. And most of the people have gone to their schools or have worked there for a long time, right? And then sort of joined as individuals. So like in a way where I'm not trying to say that like the, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm no expert in, you know, Tamil family structures or anything like this today or what that's like for anyone. But if you have this sort of closed society that's saying um, like assimilate to how we live and then you can join us, you know, what is that? What is that? that is, like yeah, you? What that's is that funny. Like? That's hilarious. Right. Um, so I, it's not that it's there's a there's never been a policy that's like Tamil people can't join. But there is a list of criteria that makes it exclusionary. Yes. And part of that is saying people that practice Hindu custom will not understand our project. Right. Yet I am so spiritual because I have this connection to Indian land. Like, what is that? What even is that? I'm just getting riled up. <laughs> That's hilarious. No, but I like it. This is just, this is so it's, fascinating. It's incoherence and it's incredibly colonial. Yeah. Right? But it's but in the name of spiritualism. So in this book, I in the book I call it uh, settler, settler utopianism. Um, right. That it's this idea that we have this utopian vision that will ultimately be good for humanity. That's what colonialism is too, right? This was the idea behind British expansion. It wasn't just to like for the pain of subjugating people. It was because they truly, and the French truly believed that, you know, enclosure and private property and hard labor and, you know, a gl- open global market was going to be better for humanity, right? That is the argument behind it. And it's, it's really, it's really similar, but you have the sort of 1960s language of multiculturalism um, that's, um, that's added on to it, I guess. Isn't Orva owned by the Indian government or certain not, parts not of it? O- not owned, um, but... Um, Funded? I, it's, well, they, they certainly, you know, it, the Indian uh, uh, governed, governed, not owned. Governed. So um, and that happened after the court case. Um, there's a book by a religious studies scholarship called, um, oh, he's, his name is Robert Minor. Um, I'd have to look up at the actual title of the book, but he actually goes into the details of the court case. Um, spiritual and the something. <laughs> Sorry, it's very uninteresting on a podcast, but I'll, I'll get you the title. No, no, it's fine. Uh, that gets into the court case. I, I, in the book, I only go up until the mother's death, um, which is the early 70s. Um, but, you know, I, I lived there in order to use the archives. Um, so that was in 2000. You lived in Oroville? Just like for six weeks. Wow. Um, what was that like? Did you have a good time? Uh, it's, weird. it's weird. It's a weird, it's a weird place. I think it's, you know, it, I, 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 you know, you said, you said the cult word early on. And I will yeah. tell you someone who's interested in that too. Like this, Oroville is just not that interesting um, to be a cult. I think, you know, and I think in the um, Kapoor's stories, I I don't know, um, but you know he he sort of talks about that a little more. I think early on there was much more of a culty feeling because it was much smaller. People were uh-huh. super devoted to the mother while she was alive. Yes, right after she, after she dies, that's a little bit of a different story. And now I really just think it operates as you know it's like a, a eco green capitalist village, right? Um, there's right. some really interesting stuff out there from workers in Oroville. Um, I can send you a link to a poem that um, there, there's a big um, garment, not garment, but a fashion, like uh, cottage industry fashion houses. So a bit of a garment industry, small scale garment industry in Oroville. So, you know, people, designers from all over India and even Europe will like go and start these little fashion houses in Oroville. And of course you have like local 
women and men um, working in them for, you know, whatever rate people are paying Indians <laughs> to work in these places, right? Um, right. But saying, you know, we're part of this spiritual utopian project. So it's, you know, it's fair trade and equal labor. But, you know, every time I've been there, there's been sort of some sort of unionization drive happening that's being squashed, like desperately squashed by people. But um, yeah, I can, I can send you a link to a poem that a garment worker wrote about this of sort of getting... They've sort of, you know, they sort of see both the, you know, the rich, wealthy socialites from Bombay and the women coming from France is the same, right? Or, you know, even that the people coming from, I'm using Bombay as an example, but lots of places um, in India as like even worse to work for, <laughs> you know, they yeah. feel more comfortable abusing the labor um, to some extent. So, you know, if you talk to workers there to Danny and that wasn't my project, but just from being there, I did that. Right, um, you know, there's there's some real labor issues um, that have been going on, and it, it's really, really obvious in the origin stories why that's true. That has been set up since the beginning, so they're really successful because you know the world sees them as fair and you know avoiding bad labor practices, even though no one asks any questions about the labor practices. They're just like, look at us, we are idealists, we're utopianists, right? Um, you can buy. Oroville incense at the Whole Foods across from my office. Like right now today, I could go buy that. <laughs> you know, so it's it's not, um, and people come and go. I mean, I think this is the other thing about it is lots of people there have EU passports or American passports or Canadian passports. Like they have, you know, the they have the privilege of having one of these passports and, and making money in dollars or euros or pounds or wherever their home base may be. And then, you know, building, it's also known for architecture. So people have done all kinds of architectural projects there. Again, think about the labor that went into those, right? Um, and yeah. why they were able to access that labor. Um, so there is a real divide for people who are, you know, the Tamil people that may have joined who don't have money to travel, who may be, aren't able to get a different kind of passport and can't go to places they want to go, right? So it's incredibly uneven in that sense because there are just a lot of different um, citizenships that that reside in India. There's, like, I believe, a special visa category for Oravillians. Whoa. In the India, Indian government. Um, this actually, you know, the ashram was writing Nehru letters um, after 1947, like asking him to allow citizenship because they live in the ashram. <laughs> um, you know, so there, there's always been this movement. And, you know, the mother comes out, she says this publicly, this is where her whole I'm both Indian and French thing comes from. I, I'm not against dual citizenship. Like I, ha I have an OCI card, OCI. I don't know if they'll ever let me use it again, but anyway. Um, so, you know, of course, I think people should have as many passports as they can get or like yeah. abolish borders and passports or whatever. But, um, but, but you can just look and see how uneven um, people's mobility is and their ability to make money is. So some people are stuck working for these wealthy people that then, I mean, it's just a microcosm of capitalist society, you know? That's crazy. But, uh, but <laughs> I'll say one thing about it. But it comes off because it is in a bubble, right? Um, have you been there? Never. Oh, okay, okay. Um, it's funny. I, you know, my family lives in Toronto, so my Indian family, a lot of them. Um, really? Here? Yeah. Where in Toronto? Brampton? I want to say Willowdale. Is that a place? I've never heard of that. Maybe, yeah, maybe like far from downtown? Close to North York. No, Willowdale, okay. I mean Rexdale. Sure. I Like their address used to say Willowdale, Ontario. No idea. I'm, I just moved here from Montreal a year or two years ago, oh, so okay. I'm still okay. learning. Well, my... I. Yeah, I have co I have cousins who live like in downtown, but um, but anyway, so I I my grandpa lived there, so I I thought Toronto was India when I was a kid. Uh, like, I would go there and only see Indians. Yeah, <laughs> and like go to a temple, and I'm like, oh, there's, there's, there's a big here. population here. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. So what I was gonna say was that India or uh, Oroville gets a lot of um, positive publicity um there was this buzzfeed india documentary made a few years ago that came out um that was sort of like look what we in greater india can learn from or it was by a brown it was by an indian journalist right yeah i think she's from bombay yeah um, okay yeah yeah and it was like that is that is just the epitome of what has happened with orville because you know it's like 
they they are saying what a success it's been. Again, this is exact. I you know I this is not to say that settler colonialism isn't a bigger problem than this because it is right. I'm not. It's not the you know erasure of indigenous peoples in the Americas, but it is. Right, they're they're following that playbook. Right, they're saying yep. look at how eco and green, and they like conserve water, and they make goat cheese, and it doesn't smell like India in here, and it's not loud like India because they like don't have trucks, you know. So there's all this like it's not India sort of discourse, right? right? And like, again, what is that except colonial ideology, right? Like India should be India. Why, you know, this, this, like, we should model India to be like this sort of clean space. Again, I'm not against cleanliness, but, um, but this idea that they did it right. It's like, okay, but take two seconds to think about how that happened. You know, maybe it's pretty comfortable to be there if you like to overlook exploited labor. Again, not that there isn't exploited labor throughout it, because there certainly is. There is, yeah. Everybody's exploiting labor, uh, uh, labor but it's not, um, it's not this, sort of a radical utopian I, success know, story that story at all and you know most again with the with the cult question in the 1960s and communes like the ones that were committed to socialist ideas didn't really last you know why because we're ensconced in these capitalist societies right so of course Oroville is thriving they are you know they're driven by profit they're yeah. doing our profit with some spiritual again i think kind of boring but i'm not a religion person so me neither but that's that's really fascinating to look at i never really thought of it that way but wow that's insane how does modi come into play with this or at least <laughs> the politics over the years throughout its history indira gandhi yeah. nehru and then you have modi who by the way i would assume wouldn't appreciate having oroville around oh he does he, he does, does. Oh, yeah well, again, for a few reasons, I was just, I'm working on something, um, bringing these together right now, actually, but Modi made his first trip to, I can actually have this open on my desktop. He made his first trip to Pondicherry as prime minister um, in, I have the date right here. Pauses are un un uninteresting, uh, tw in 2018. So he went for the golden jubilee, the 50 year anniversary That's of Orville. Orville. This was his first trip to Pondicherry. Right, so he goes to go to the Golden Good Jubilee and he goes to the Matra Mandir and he um, celebrates Aurobindo. And again, Aurobindo is really, really celebrated in India as an anti-colonial um, freedom fighter. He really fits the model of, of like who India wants to celebrate as, as a freedom fighter. Um, freedom so fighter turned to, spiritual guru. Yeah, that's perfect. That is like perfect, absolutely yeah. perfect for, for our Modi, right? And he goes in 2018 and then he like tax on Pondicherry afterwards. So the only reason he goes to the region, region is to go to Oroville, right? And then he's like, okay, I better stop by Pondicherry and like campaign for the BJP, right? Right. Um, which, you know, not a huge, huge following in Tamil Nadu, but, um, but enough. Um, so it, it actually, it really fits into this model um, again, uh, you know, the, the Modi regime has been promoting this sort of green city. It's a green city, industrial city, wired city. Now I can't remember the title, but there's like an initiative to modernize certain cities and Pondicherry is, is one of those um, that has been um, has been designated one of these. I want to say it's called green, but I, I could be totally wrong with it. Um, so, you know, it fits into his like he he would love sort of the um, the and I say this in the book, they will. People really who um, are centered to write really like that the mother and Orbindo had this partnership, but it was celibate, right? It's not, you don't have to worry about sort of, um, you don't have to worry about sullying the gene pool. You can be, a, you know, you can be a race nationalist and, and appreciate the, the relationship between the mother and Orbindo because what they wanted to do was like, create these quote unquote friendships, right? Of uh, East and West working together. Okay. And, um, you know, that means that you get to sort of keep your good, your good Hindu-ness separate yeah. from, you know, what could come with the racial uh, degeneration of inter-race mixing or something like that. You don't get into any of that, which the state has frowned upon, right? Instead it's, um, we want the West, to appreciate India for what it really is, which is a Hindu nation, 
right? Um, it like that it fits into that idea that that idea that Modi likes, right? And that people on the on the right like, um, and that um, you know we should have people come and celebrate that and say that the land is spiritual. Like we like those ideas. Oh, we like those ideas. I those, see. Like, those ideas, we should say that yoga is essentially an Indian practice, right? Yes. That it belongs to this religious tradition that um, is inherent and organic to the land that we come from, not, you know, socially constructed through the last 200 years. So basically from his perspective, Oroville is kind of like a, a hub where outsiders can come in and appreciate what makes India so great. And bring their tourist money. And bring their money, and then yeah. they can just leave after leave. with a good uh, yeah. feeling. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. You know, Let's and see. Indira Gandhi was there also. She was there in 1960. She was there right after Oroville opened. She went to Oroville. Um, mm-hmm. You know, she <laughs> I just had this open on my desktop. I have it sitting right here. Uh, her message in March th- 25th of 1969, I'll just read it. Pondicherry was Sri Aurobindo's place of political exile and spiritual unfolding. It is appropriate that seekers of enlightenment from various lands should found a new city here in Pondicherry bearing Sri Aurobindo's name. It is an exciting project for bringing about harmony among different cultures and for understanding the environmental needs for man's spiritual growth. May Oroville truly become a city of light and of peace. So she comes to Oroville and says that in 1969. And they're all, the mother and uh, the, the main architect is a man named Roger Anger, uh, A-G-A-N-G-E-R, uh, who's French. And they um, and the others involved were really, 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 really committed to getting sort of global support for Oroville before it opened. So there's Sri Aurobindo centers all over the world, but they also, they seek out the validation of UNESCO, the United Nation Education, science culture organization um, to, you know, give it their seal of approval even before they built it. So, you know, they've been claiming- Which they did. Which they did. So United Nations gives them grants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they like, they are like, this is a great project. UNESCO, you know, it's been UNESCO backed since the beginning and they were involved in that opening ceremony. So they've always wanted to sort of go beyond the scope of, so they were, they, you know, they've been the global visionaries. That's interesting. Yeah. Who who owns uh, who owns it now? Like who who is the who's the one getting all the profits now? Well, so the, the I mean the industries are owned by individuals, right? Yeah. Um, I mean they so they uh, they operate on they say they operate on sort of a socialist economy, <laughs> but it kind of means there's a central bank. And I'm I'm not sure today how this works. People that like are members and live there, there is you have to, I believe, pay for your house to be built. Right, or you're buying it from someone. Um, I could, I, I, I haven't been there in a while, so I'm not sure how exactly it works today. Um, but then um, there is sort of this idea that there's a monthly allowance stipend for people that are members, right? But then beyond that, people are um, making money through their industries. They're making money from maybe things they're doing in Europe or other places. So it's not, you know, like a socialist society where truly everybody has the same um, means at all, right? Um, so I, I, in terms of ownership of property, um, I, I actually should just not answer that because I'm not totally sure. Okay, fair but enough. Somehow like within the Oroville Trust and um, the people in there, it's you know, like, they're trying to acquire more land. Yeah. They, they want more space. And is somebody stopping them? Is there resistance from them owning more land? Yeah, well, it's just like they have to buy it from people, right? So there's plenty of um, local Tamil people who aren't going to sell them their land at this point. <laughs> um, so yeah, they've, they've had trouble getting more land, I think. But um, yeah, it's not it's not 1968 anymore. So <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they found it, they were like, we're going to be for 50,000 people. And it's, be, it's like stayed steady between two and 3,000 people. It's huge. It's like a crazy looking like a cloud like um spiral Uh, kind of yeah yeah the galaxy a galaxy yes yes a galaxy it looks like a crazy galaxy and it's huge yeah yeah they have a lot of land Uh, and you know i should say like private beaches private beaches wow so that you know the locals can't come and um harass the women in their um bikinis you know all of the things that happen to you in india safe in orville you're safe from the Again, I'm not like, it's not a comment um, 
to validate like how sexuality works and in, in wider India and how women are treated, which, which is a problem. But all they do is privatize the beach and say like, this is a European space, basically. That's fascinating. Yeah. And anything you want to, I think, you know, we're out of time, but that was really fascinating. That's really cool. I'm, I'm excited for you to hear this. Do you want to add anything before we go? Do you want to? No, thanks, for, a- thanks for doing this. Thank you for your Instagram. It's so cool. I love what you're doing. I love it when non-academics do history. That's, that's my preference, honestly. Sorry, everyone.